Do not treat with scorn the blood of the covenant. Do not despise and insult the spirit of grace that right now in this room is brooding over this people. But rather, repent, yield, and receive the asbestos righteousness of Jesus and clothe yourselves with it so that when you walk into the flame of judgment at the end it will be like a vacation on the beach with the sun shining bright and not fire who is the only one who can rescue humanity at the final judgment in this episode of light and truth John Piper opens Hebrews 10, 26 to 31 to reveal the sole hope for salvation in the face of God's righteous judgment. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on April 13th, 1997. For whom is there no longer a sacrifice for sins? Get the question now and ask, is that me? For whom is there no longer a sacrifice for sins, but only a fiery, terrible expectation of divine wrath? Now, the answer to that question is what this text is all about. And it is given in two ways, and we'll take them one at a time. First, it is given by describing those people in terms of what they have become that makes them fit for wrath. And then it describes those people in terms of what they once were, which makes all the worse their fitness for wrath. That's what this text is about. Two descriptions of people. What they are like now that makes them so fit for judgment and what they once were but are no more. Let's take them one at a time. What are they now that makes them so fit for judgment? And there are five descriptions. I'll just take them very briefly. Number one, verse 26 They go on sinning willfully. Two words are very crucial here. The tense of go on sinning. Present continuous action, go on sinning. And then this other word coming in to show you the kind of persons they become. Willfully. Willfully. So there's a extent to it, and there's an aggravation to it. This text is not about any old particular sin that you might call the unpardonable sin. Many people have wrestled with this text. Ah, What's the unpardonable sin here that goes beyond forgiveness? It's not talking about a sin. Lust, greed, some terrible sexual thing you might do. They're all forgivable. It's not a person in this room who doesn't need to go to doesn't deserve to go to hell. We've all committed sins. Some horrid ones and some less seemingly horrible ones. That's not what this verse is about. This verse is about going on willfully pursuing a life of sin with indifference to what you once knew. So if you would ask me, what's the unpardonable sin? I would say, nobody knows except God. But there is a line drawn in the life of going on willfully until one day you're over into being Esau. Chapter 12, verse 17, who cried out for repentance and could not do it. The unforgivable sin is the sin for which you cannot authentically repent. And that arrives in life when you willfully pursue against grace, knowledge, blood, Son of God, 
sin. Do not presume that you may not cross it this afternoon. Do not presume that you have five years before you get to that point. You may be too far gone this morning. I do not know. The question is, can you repent? And you might be too far gone tomorrow, but not today. Today, harden not your hearts. He weeps in chapter 3. Please, today, harden not your hearts. Why? Because tomorrow they may be too hard. Oh, how many people play with God. Number 2, verse 27, at the end, the word adversaries. The fury of God's fire will consume the adversaries. That's the second description of what people have become who are beyond this. They're not just people who sin here or there or fight in and out of lust or something. These are people who become the adversaries of God. Thirdly, verse 29, they have trampled underfoot the Son of God. The Son of God has appeared to them in some way in a sermon on the radio, in their Bible reading. He has, as it were, laid himself on the ground as a sacrifice to be received as their substitute. They have looked at him, become a little bit religious, and stepped on his neck to move on to sin. Fourthly, They regard as unclean or common the blood of the covenant. Unclean is not quite the right word, I don't think. It's common, ordinary, nothing special, nothing sacred, nothing precious here. And so many of them have come to church and they have stood or walked or sat and taken that little cup of the emblem of the most precious reality in the universe and have looked at it and said, nice juice, drunk it. And gone out to sin. And treated as common the blood of the Son of God. Lastly, the fifth description of what they've become is verse 29. They insulted the Spirit of grace. The Spirit of grace moves in this building every Sunday. It's moving right now. The Spirit of grace is brooding over this room right now. You are here by virtue of the Spirit of grace in your life. You you might sit there and say, "I've I've never known the Spirit of grace. How could I insult the Spirit of grace? You're here by virtue of the Spirit of grace. You breathe by virtue of the Spirit of grace. You're hearing my words right now with a brain that's functioning by virtue of the Spirit of grace. You haven't walked out of this room as uncomfortable as you feel right now by virtue of the Spirit of grace. And many people even take the Spirit of grace to themselves and then make it into a license For sin, because he will always forgive. And little by little, that too becomes unnecessary and can be thrown away. And they enter into life of willful sinning. Now that leaves one last thing to do here. That's the description of what these people had become. Such that the writer says, you press on in that. And there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but only judgment. Now the question is, who were they? Where did they come from? What kind of people were they before this happened to them? And that's what makes this text really controversial. There are three descriptions of them, and we close by a brief look at this description. The first one is in verse 26. These are people who have the knowledge of the truth. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. The casualties of God's wrath in this text are people who have trampled upon the Son knowingly. 
They know the truth. The Bible teaches that we will all be judged according to the measure of light and truth that we have. And we have a lot. They were walking away from Christ in the broad daylight of the truth. Secondly, they are described surprisingly to our ears, I think, as God's people. Look at verse 30. To explain what's happening in divine vengeance, he says at the end of verse 30, the Lord will judge his people. Now that is very important to understand the dynamic of this text. You must come to terms with the fact that this judgment, this wrath, this fire, this anger is coming against my people, says the Lord. What's that mean? I believe it means that this writer sees the visible church, the church that shows up on Sunday morning, the visible church. He sees the visible church the same way he saw the people of Israel. God's people, right? All saved? Wrong. For example... Ezekiel chapter 34, 17, God says, As for you, my flock, and I talk like this, I talk like this. As for you, my flock, behold, I will judge between one sheep and another, between rams and he goats. In other words, in the Bible, the phrase church, or the phrase, my people, or God's people, refers in the judgment of charity to all who have either in the Old Testament by virtue of being born Jews or being circumcised, and in the New Testament by virtue of professing faith in Christ, joining the church, taking the sacraments, are treated as God's people. And every biblical writer knew All God's people weren't saved. Externally, he calls them the people of God. He even calls them brothers, holy brothers, in chapter 3, giving them all the benefit of the doubt that their profession of faith in the Messiah is true. But there are many hypocrites, both in Israel... And in the church of Jesus Christ, visibly. The visible church and the true church of the elect are not identical. And the Bible often treats the visible church as the people of God. And so these people who have entered into willful sinning and left behind the sacrifice of the Son trampling him under their feet are my people up to a certain point. Finally, the most controversial of all is in verse 29. They are sanctified. They were sanctified. How much severer punishment do you think will he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean or common the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. Wow. That's scary. Now, I'm going to close with this. I do not... This is very controversial. And I'll give you three views and tell you which one's mine. One view... The first two are not mine. One view is 
that this text therefore teaches that you can be born of God, justified, and consequently sanctified, and lost in the end because of having thrown away your faith. So there is no eternal security, they would say, and this text proves it. Because a person being sanctified is clearly on the other side of new birth and justification, and therefore new birth and justification guarantee nothing about whether you make it to heaven. So there's no eternal security. That's one very, very common view. A second view is that the possibility being held out here concerning sanctified people becoming apostate never, in fact, happens. It is only a theoretical possibility. If they forsook the faith, they would, in fact, be lost, but they will never forsake the faith because God commits himself to his elect to preserve them. And indeed, I do believe he does. That's not my view either. I cannot escape the implication that this writer thinks this happens. I really think this writer believes this happens. So, uh, the question is whether or not it does jeopardize eternal security, and if not, why not? I do not embrace the rejection of eternal security, and I don't think this verse calls it into question. First of all, because elsewhere in the book it is so powerfully taught. Let me just give you two key verses. Hebrews 3.14 says, We have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast our begin- the beginning of our assurance to the end. Which means, if you don't hold fast the beginning of your assurance to the end, you had not become a partaker of Christ. Perseverance to the end in faith is a sign that you did become a partaker. Failure to persevere to the end is a sign that you did not ever become a partaker of Christ. That's what that verse seems to me very clearly teaches. Here's one that we just talked about a few weeks ago. Fifteen verses earlier in this chapter, you could let your eyes go up there and see this one. Verse 14 of chapter 10, you get this glorious gospel word that goes like this. By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Or more literally, those who are being sanctified. Now there's a verse to put over against 29 and puzzle with. You talk about a puzzle. I'm glad those two verses come from the same chapter in the same book. Because unless you're willing to say this man has such a brain problem that he can't remember what he wrote 15 verses earlier, you've got to come to terms with the fact that verse 14 says, those who are being sanctified have been perfected forever by a single sacrifice. And therein lies the gospel. So what are we going to do now? Verse 29 says... They were sanctified, and now they're on their way to hell. And verse 14 says, they were being sanctified, and therefore they're perfected forever by a single all-sufficient sacrifice. Is this double talk? My conclusion is that the kind of sanctification in verse 14 and the kind in verse 29 are not the same. The process of spiritual transformation into the likeness of Christ in verse 14 proves a genuine united heart to Christ. However, whatever it was in verse 29 simply exacerbates the judgment when a person throws over his face. So what could it be? I mean, what, 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 is, what is this sanctification in verse 29 after which you can be lost? It's really not hard to give an answer to that from the book of Hebrews and elsewhere in the Bible or from this church's experience. Here's what I think it means. It means 
a religious separation from the world as you draw near to the people of God and indeed to God. It means an outward purification of life. Like Jesus said, you cleanse the outside of the cup. It's coming under the influence of the truth Sunday after Sunday in the reading and the preaching and the singing and the praying of God's word, which has an inevitable moral impact upon people's lives who are not born again. It is coming under the influence of a loving congregation who act in a way and out of a spirit that is so different from the world. It, it, it begins to shape you and guide you, even when you have not yet been changed inside. It is the coming under the influence of the, the ordinances and the taking in your hand that emblem of the most precious of all realities and drinking it to yourself. And Paul says, if you drink, Unworthily, you drink damnation to yourself. So Paul had the same kind of trampling and scorning in view that the writer of the Hebrews does. And in all of this, they are visibly set apart. That's what sanctification means. Visibly set apart from the world, sanctified exactly like the people of Israel were by virtue of circumcision and many sacrifices and much blood work most of whom were lost. And lest we miss the phrase, verse 29, I do acknowledge, says, it happened by the blood of the covenant, because I believe every single gospel influence in a person's life, the preaching of the word, the love of God's people, the ordinances, and the common grace that draws them, are all purchased by the blood of Jesus. Even short of salvation. I close with a warning. As earnestly as I know how, you in this room now, even if this is the first time you ever came to church, have knowledge. Do not trample the Son of God Under your feet. Do not treat with scorn the blood of the covenant. Do not despise and insult the spirit of grace that right now in this room is brooding over this people. But rather, repent, yield, and receive the asbestos righteousness of Jesus and clothe yourselves with it so that when you walk into the flame of judgment at the end, it will be like a vacation on the beach with sun shining bright and not fire. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our nine-part series, The Christ-Centered Life, with a sermon titled, Choose to Share in Suffering. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.